So you also must be ready, for the Son of Man will come at an unexpected hour. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Some of you have heard this in previous homilies, but when I started serving churches 23 years ago, it was a Methodist church, was my first church. My grandmother was a parishioner, and for three years I would go to her house almost every single day, mainly because she had a stocked refrigerator, and I didn't. And I would have lunch with her, and we would, well not we, I would sit with her as she would watch Days of Our Lives. That was our daily routine as I watched the sands fall through the hourglass as all the drama of those characters unfolded uh, year after year. I've been thinking about that image of sitting with my grandmother and those sands falling through the hourglass and the passage of time. Today, Ella McFerrin is with us. She's in the choir. Ella is going to college this week. When I arrived here, Ella was in preschool. Sands through the hourglass, Ella. Raymond Hawkins is also with us in the choir. He was at nine o'clock. If you remember Raymond, Raymond was our organist years ago when we hired him in high school. Now he's returned to visit with us with his wife. Time marches on. Sands through the hourglass. I look forward to having lunch today with Raymond. I expect Kristen to be there as well. A few sands have fallen through since I've seen her, so I'm looking forward to catching up with her. Today is also the 17th anniversary of my first Mass. I was ordained 17 years ago yesterday. A lot of Sands have gone through the hourglass since that day. It's interesting how much has changed. I was curious. This is not a happy statistic, but one that talks about change. Is it from the day or the year I was ordained till 2020, not counting COVID? Do you know our church has lost 42% of Sunday morning attendance during that time? A lot of change. A lot of sands in the hourglass. I've been thinking, I think there are three categories of us who, who look at that hourglass as the sands fall through, and we have different perspectives. I think there are people maybe like Ella and Raymond and Gray, who's going to college next week, and they statistically have more grains of sand on the top part than the bottom, and their life is ahead of them with all of that excitement, but also some anxiety, because they have school ahead of them. They have a family ahead of them. They have a career ahead of them. They have who knows where they might live and what they might experience ahead of them. And that's full of excitement, but also anxiety. Why? Because they have school ahead of them and a family ahead of them and a career they don't yet know what that might be and where they might live and what they might experience. There are those who statistically have maybe more sands at the bottom than the top. And when each grain that passes by it's a bitter pill of counting how many they, they might have left and lamenting that so much has passed. And then there are those like me, I think, who are statistically in the middle where we have maybe equal parts above and below, which sometimes puts people my age into a tailspin because we don't know if we have more behind us or more ahead of us. And so we're not sure how to be optimistic and hopeful or if we turn bitter at the passage of time. All of this involves change. Change we can't control, change that may be good, change that may be bad, but change nonetheless. And we resist that, I think, no matter what our age is, especially though as those sands begin to fall through, we begin to become more aware of that one great change that meets us at the end and fills us with anxiety. But friends, John Henry Newman once said that change is the only evidence that something is alive. 
And change is not something that we can control. Our externals, our environment, what happens to us. What we're called to pay attention to, however, is how we respond in the midst of uncertainty and what we don't know. How we remain constant and stable in the face of change. And so today in the first lesson, we, we have the sands coming through the hourglass of Abram, who later becomes Abraham. We're in chapter 15 today. And we hear the covenant renewed with Abram by God, where God tells Abram to go and look out at the sky and see the stars in the vast expanse of space, something that we're getting a real close look at as we see those amazing images from the James Webb Telescope to know just how remarkable of an image God is giving to Abram. He says, see all these stars? Your descendants will be greater than the stars in the sky. You will be a great nation, which was good news to Abram because he had no child. He had no heir, as we hear about today. But the story begins in chapter 12, not chapter 15, where Abram appears at the bottom of a genealogy and seemingly out of nowhere, God makes a covenant with the Hebrew people through Abram and says to him, I will be your God and I will make you a great nation and I will bring you to a place, a place that heretofore you've never been to, that you don't know, that you have no idea what awaits you, but I will be your God, and I will make you a great nation. And Abram trusted in this promise, and a later New Testament writer tells us this was reckoned to him as righteousness. This is an image of faith, of trusting in the midst of uncertainty and of change. But it wasn't easy. This wasn't an image of Abram having this great moment of faith and everything was smooth sailing from that moment on. No, everything becomes chaotic from that moment on. As soon as we hear of the story of God's covenant with Abram, Abram discovers he's in a famine and travels to Egypt. Remember the story? He passes off his wife as his sister so they'll mess with her and not with him to save his own skin. A very unsavory act. And then after the famine, there is division in his own family as there is tension between Abram's camp and Lot's camp and they have to separate and go their separate ways. And then after that, there is a war that Abram has to join in and fight and he meets this mysterious Christ-like figure, Melchizedek, and he gives him a tenth of everything that he has. So the moment that Abram has this covenant with God, there is famine, there is family strife, there is war back to back to back. And then today, this is where we have the covenant renewed. But that's not the end of the story there. It's not as if he's gone through these difficult times, these changes, and everything now is stable. No. Then we have Hagar and Ishmael. Tensions between Hagar and Sarah. We have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We have the visit of the the three heavenly beings at the Oaks of Mamre to tell Abram that he is a very old man and his wife, a very old woman, are about to give birth. We have Isaac. We have the sacrifice or attempted sacrifice of Isaac. No, the only thing that's constant in this story is that everything changes. The only thing constant in this story is God's promise. In the beginning, God tells Abram that when you walk on this path that I lay before you, your descendants will be more numerous than the dust you walk on. Then he says, look at the sky and see the stars. It will be greater than that. And then yet again, look at the grains of sand on the seashore. More than that. The one thing that never changed, that never faulted, that was constant, was God's fidelity. The writer to the Hebrews gives us a glimpse of what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. Meaning if we engage in matters of faith, there will always be, always be an element of uncertainty. There will always be things beyond our control. There will always be things we don't understand. That's what makes it faith. Because we can't fully see. We can't completely understand. 
so we trust. And that's what we as Christians are called to do in Christ Jesus, who is our constant, who is our rock, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as the world spins seemingly sometimes out of control, he is in the middle. The cross is the center of our lives. The cross is the center of our universe. And it's in him and through him that we come to know the constancy of God's love and promise. And so for those who look at their hourglass and they statistically have more grains above than below, people like Gray and Ella and Raymond and others, I would say that as you look at your life, there will always be threats that the world's going to come to an end. There will always be those who will say, this is the worst generation. But every generation's heard that. I came of age watching the towers fall. Generation before me came to age watching Vietnam. Generation before them watched the bomb fall. Generation before them saw the Great World War. Generation before them saw something equally as horrible. Every generation encounters strife and difficulty and anxiety and uncertainty of what lies ahead. But one thing has always remained the same. The sun rises. The sun sets. The promise and presence of the Lord. Do not be afraid. For those who may have more sands on the bottom part than the top part, look with gratitude on the fidelity of the Lord throughout your entire life, of the things you've seen and experienced, of the trials you've endured, and looking back from a perspective of time, knowing that the Lord was with you. I, mean, I was thinking about John Googe, who comes to 9 o'clock. John Googe is the most seasoned of our members. He's 97 years old, a charter member of this parish. And think for a moment of the things he has seen in his lifetime. Born 20 years or so after the Wright brothers left this earth at Kitty Hawk, flew a P-51 Mustang in World War II, and now is watching people buy a ticket to orbit in space. What's the one thing that has remained the same between them all, between the Wright brothers and that P-51 Mustang and astronauts? Prayer before flight. <laughs> the promise of the Lord has endured. Things change, things develop, things get better, things get worse. But the promise of the Lord stays the same. And for those of us who are struggling because we're not sure whether to be hopeful for the future or to be reflective of the past, where there's equal parts above and below. I say to myself and those in my generation, not to be anxious about those sands as they fall. Time is not our prison. Time only becomes our prison if we associate our purpose with what we can accomplish and what we can accumulate. It is freedom to know we are at our fullness in Jesus Christ, not by what we do in corporate America or our bank account or anything in between, but that the Lord gives us our purpose, our meaning, and our identity. So if everything is taken away, we are still who we are called to be in the Lord. Jesus Christ tells us today to be to be ready, for we do not know at what hour those sands will stop falling. In other words, be in this moment. Be purely in this moment, with both anticipation and excitement for the breath that we're about to draw, with gratitude of what we have seen and the Lord's presence, and knowing that we are who we are called to be fully in him. And so may we all gaze upon the Lord and gaze upon him on the cross so that whether we're anxious about the future or we lament the passage of time or we're not sure which way to go, 
We can see all of our wounds and anxieties, all of our triumphs, all of our loves, all of the hatred that we have endured, everything in him on the cross. And let us gaze upon him with devotion and prayer. Let us gaze upon him wanting to be close to him, even if we're not sure we're there. Let us gaze upon him until we finally see our lives in his love, in his wounds, until we finally see ourselves with him on the cross. And in doing so, if we see ourselves so completely in him, when people look upon us, they will see his love. They will see his mercy. They will see his grace. When they look upon us, who is constantly looking upon the Lord, they too will see him. Let us give thanks for the sands that have fallen through. Let us rejoice with those who have so much ahead of them. Let us give thanks with those who look back on such great blessings. And let us praise the Lord in this moment, for through it all, with everyone, he is faithful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.